Yo guys, punk around another video. Now, like usual, when I make a video like this, what do I say? I say, ZG is right around the corner, friends. It's been confirmed that about a week, a week and a half ago, it's going to be released in April. We don't know if that's early April, mid-April, or late. But regardless of that, we know that it's coming out soon. So with that being said, it's time to prepare. And like I do for every single phase, I'm gonna give you guys a preparation guide. Give you guys some little tips on what to get ready for before ZG releases. Now, obviously, ZG is just a 20-man raid, so you might be thinking there's not too much that you have to do it doesn't have a huge relevance in terms of world first or anything like that so when it comes to flasks and certain consumables you're probably not going to need to push too hard in that respect but zg comes with a lot of little things that you might not be aware of so i'm going to try and fill you in on everything and also phase four isn't necessarily just zg so let's cover everything that you need to do in order to get ready for phase four let's get into it all right now firstly let's cover ab really quick although keep in mind that i did make two videos talking about it already so i'm not going to go into too much detail but in general, nothing really has changed. You just want to have the generic consumables that you would have for any PvP scenario. Free action potions, health pots, mana pots, limited invulnerability. But a couple things that I'd say are very specific towards AB that you want to make sure that you're absolutely stocked on are grenades, mortars, and sapper charges. And this is just to stop people from capping the flag from either far range or when there's multiple people, if you don't have an AoE ability, you can do that. And another thing that I mentioned in the last video is you want to make sure that you have Noggin Fogger elixirs. If you have haven't finished this quest. I know it sounds pretty crazy, but there's surprisingly a lot of people that haven't finished the quest line for this item. You want to make sure before you go into ZG that you have a ton of them, and that's how you can pop the potion and slow fall off of any of the ledges. Again, something I mentioned in the last video. But let's move on from AB because there's not really too much to talk about there. And before we get into the Emerald Drakes or the fishing tournament, let's talk about the PSWZ sauce itself, Zulgarub. The first thing that we have to talk about are crafting materials. The most impactful thing that's being released with Phase 4 in ZG are the top tier recipes. And obviously the first one that you're expecting me to say right now is Bloodvine. Now, if you guys have been following parses, if you guys have been following the damage meter over the last couple phases, you might've noticed that Warlocks struggle very heavily. And this is because Warlocks are very hit gear dependent, but they don't have too much access to any hit rating at all in the current itemization. Bloodvine is a three piece caster set that for the most part is better than most of the gear that you can get all the way up to Nax unless you have very specific itemization elsewhere in order to carry your hit rating. And for Warlocks, it's pretty much best in slot until tier 3. This is going to be the most in-demand recipe for a while after Phase 4 releases. And what I mean by that is potentially thousands of players on your server all looking for these items to craft. Every single mage that's raiding most likely doesn't have all the best in slot gear, and even the ones that do are most likely going to want to rock maybe just the chess piece. Every single Warlock on your server is going to be pushing for this, maybe even Shadow Priests, Boomkins. Pretty much every single caster on your server is going to want to go for this and everybody who has a mage alt or a warlock alt is also going to want to craft that for their alt to be able to compete on the dps meters so clearly this is a great opportunity if you're a tailor but the way that you can prepare for this specifically is by buying mooncloth over the last month or so i've been buying a decent amount myself personally i've bought it at like 15 gold each for a while now and i'm assuming at least this is just my prediction that once cg releases for the first couple weeks at least i think mooncloth will go up to maybe 40, 45, 50 gold. And the reason why I think it's so predictable that it's going to end up spiking is just because the demand is going to far overweigh the supply. Mooncloth can only be crafted once every four days. It's not like tailors are just going to be able to pump it out like crazy. By virtue of the way that it's crafted, there's going to be limited supply in respect to how many people need a ton of it. Now, another item in association with this that might actually spike again due to the fact that it's not super common, but it will actually drop in ZG. So I'm not 100% sure is powerful mojo. This is also going to be used in a couple recipes. And of course, iron web spider silk, it might go up a little bit, but who really knows? Now, these next two recipes are actually something that's going to become a staple of people's raid preparation. And that's because they're some of the best consumables that you can get. We're talking about weapon oils in brilliant mana oil and brilliant wizard oil. You guys probably remember this from TBC plus because it was super common, but this is also a thing in classic. Wow, it just comes in late. The wizard oil applies 36 spell power to your weapon plus one spell crit and the mana oil gives you mp5 the wizard oil is going to be extremely lucrative considering all casters and paladins are going to be gunning after this as much as possible large brilliant shards right now are incredibly cheap and i mean incredibly cheap so there's a potential for them to actually rise considering that wizard oil is a consumable that people are going to be using every 30 minutes all across the raid that's a ridiculous increase in the amount of usage 
for that specific crafting item. When you have such a spike in terms of demand, supply might not be able to keep up, or of course, the law of economics might state that it goes up a little bit. I think large brilliant shards are very undervalued, so you might want to stock up on a ton of them. Also, Fire Bloom and Purple Lotus, they might go up as well. Purple Lotus is pretty much useless right now, but it might go up a little bit considering it's being used for brilliant mana oil. The next consumable is a Mage Blood Potion, but you can't really prepare for this to be completely honest because Dream Four and Plague Bloom are already in such high demand that I don't think much is going to change. Now, the next consumable that's actually really, really interesting that's coming out is the Living Action Potion, and this is different from the Free Action Potion. It essentially has the same effect, except it only lasts for five seconds. The only differentiating factor is that you can use it basically as a PvP trinket to get out of stuns rather than having to use it preemptively. This is a huge change, and it's for sure going to be something along the lines of value as a Free Action Potion, potentially even more. So you might want to get some Heart of the Wild, some Ice Cap, and potentially Mountain Silver Sage. But to be completely honest, a lot of those materials, except maybe the Heart of the Wild, are going to have and keep their relative value. Now, the next item that I would definitely start stacking on are Librams of Rapidity. I've bought a ton of these at one gold each. That sounds pretty crazy, but the reason why they're going to go up in value right now is because you're going to be able to hand these in to Zanza and Zalgarub for a nature resistance enchant rather than the 1% attack speed that you have access to right now with this Libram. And why this is important obviously is nature resistance for AQ40. All the top guilds are going to require you to have a nature set and of course the nature resistance enchants. You might also want to farm the blood of heroes, which is going to be used within the quest in order to get access to the Arcanum, as well as being used in Gurubashi Mojo Madness. The Gurubashi Mojo Madness is actually created by alchemists and it requires level 300. There's a brazier near the Tablet of Madness that you can extinguish with this item, which then spawns a boss. One of four bosses specifically in Grillek, Zara, Renataki, and Wushule. All of these guys have a chance of dropping ridiculously good trinket items for specific classes. If you've watched some of the videos that I've made in the past, the Renataki charms for hunters and rogues specifically are some of the best PvP trinkets in the entire game, but I'll most likely be making a separate video covering all of this on a later date. So if you're an alchemist, you might want to be looking for some blood of heroes over the next couple weeks. Get ahead of the curve before there's a feeding frenzy in Eastern Plaguelands for everyone trying to get the bloods. Another thing when it comes to ZG that I'm going to mention really quick here is you and your guild should decide what you want to do with bijous and coins. Bijous and coins are rep hand in items that drop off all the trash in ZG. And to be honest, for the first couple weeks, you might want to sell them. The reason why I say this is because I think they're going to be extremely high valued. In fact, overvalued for the first couple weeks. People are going to want to buy them and then hand in to try to get their rep. So you as a guild or you as a player might want to decide whether you want the rep right now or you want to make some gold right now off selling them and then worry about the rep later. Kind of a minor thing, but just some food for thought. I think that's pretty much it when it comes to ZG. So let's talk about the fishing tournament right now. You guys might be aware of the fishing tournament, of course, in Booty Bay, the Master Angler Tournament. This is also being released with ZG. With this comes new cooking recipes for fish and a bunch of quite interesting rewards. One of them being an item that literally turns you into a fish and you can just kind of swim around in the ocean. You can get boots, a helmet, all kinds of different items. But once again, I might cover this in another video. The point is just get your fishing ready if you plan on participating in the event. Also, keep in mind that you can summon Gazranka, who's the boss that you can actually fish out of the waters in ZG. If you want to be the guy who's fishing him out, the guy who has fishing in all of the pugs or whatever, then start leveling your fishing right now. The last and final thing that we have to talk about are the Dragons of Nightmare, the Emerald Dragons, the new world bosses that are hitting live servers. There's four of them specifically, Emerus, Lethon, Isandra, and Terrar. Right now, in terms of world bosses, we only have two. We have Azergos and Kazakh. Well, things are about to change quite significantly considering we're going to have six going forward. This gives you and your guild a much higher chance of gaining access to one of the kills, especially considering that some of them are in a very friendly location. For instance, one of them spawns in Duskwood, which as an alliance player is really easy to get to. Another one spawns in Hinterlands, which is maybe neutral between the Undercity and Ironforge. We've got one in Feralis, which is quite neutral, but I'd say a little bit Horde favored. And then Ashenvale, again, I'd say quite Horde favored, but we do have Darnassus. I think Horde has a little bit of an advantage on this one, but I'd say the one that's most faction biased is definitely the one in Duskwood. So at least we have that going for us on Alliance side. One thing that you want to do if you plan on securing these bosses is make low level alts, make level 20 warlock alts and park them at all of the respective locations. This way you can have people scouting for them. And once they spawn, it's time to summon your raid members there. The Emerald 
dragons are incredibly important. And one thing that you want to do is prepare for world PvP encounters. And by doing this, of course, you need sapper charges, you need free action potions, limited invulnerability potions, and of course, explosives. Same thing like preparing for any PvP encounter except here it's probably even more important and you want fire protection potions, nature protection potions, frost protection potions, arcane protection potions, everything in order to survive through an AoE onslaught from the enemy faction. And on top of that, a lot of these bosses do nature damage, so make sure that you have a ton of nature protection potions. These guys are super important to Pryo because they actually drop nature resistance gear. This is something that every guild is going to want to get access to. The more NR that you get in your raid, the easier the AQ40 on specific bosses is going to be. Invisidus, and of course, Princess Huhuran. So you might have thought that world bosses were a little bit of a cluster. Well, it's about to get a whole lot more intense. And I'd say the Emerald Dragons make the world boss PvP experience a lot better for the average player. So get ready and outer world brawls are about to call you to battle. So that's pretty much all I have for this one. I tried to do a little bit of a glossary overview over everything. And don't worry for the stuff that I didn't go into too much detail over, I'll most likely make some other videos to fill you in on everything that they have to offer. But of course, if you like this video, make sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill soldiers. Hit the notification bell to be notified every single time I post a new video straight out of the render oven. And with that said, good luck in the world PvP, good luck in AB, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.